Hey everyone, Mark Alexander here. I hope you're having a great day, a great life, and that your loved ones are all very healthy. Um, today we're going to do Why is Shakespeare Great? And let me, uh, I'm wearing my Harvard hat today, partly because, you know, I never went to Harvard, but I wore this, I bought this hat in Cambridge many, many years ago when I did a, I gave a lecture on Shakespeare's knowledge of law at the Radcliffe Institute um, for Advanced Studies. And I, I just had a blast and had to buy the hat. And I'm also wearing this multicolor um, shirt, which for me kind of represents Shakespeare and all the different things you could say about Shakespeare and why is Shakespeare great. Um, what I'm going to do is a little different. Now, a lot of people talk about his stories being archetypal, which they are in many ways, his incredible influence um, on, on later writers, which is understandable once you really know Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is not as hard as people think. If you have a good teacher, if you have a bad teacher, uh, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Uh, good teachers, you know, I didn't get it. I, I was in, in a community college. I was exposed to Shakespeare and I had one teacher. I just thought it was all about metrics and iambic pentameter and a bunch of stuff that was just boring. But um, as an uh, upper division student, I found a teacher that just brought it to life. And I finally realized, oh, okay, I get it now. I get why Shakespeare is great. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take one of these colors, you know, probably more along here, um, and just explore one little aspect, not about his poetry necessarily, not about um, um, all of his metaphors and similes, and just the kind of artistic, incredible things that Shakespeare is doing, how he works on multiple levels. I'm going to just talk about Shakespeare's language. Shakespeare's language. And I'm going to do it in an unusual way. Let me go back to the presentation. And um, dum, ba, dum, ba, dum, ba, ba. yeah, so what I'm going to do, and um, I just want to, I don't know, I just, I just want to do this. Okay. Um, let me get back and make sure this works. Come on, are you working? Come on, are you going forward? There we go, there. Okay, um, I'm gonna tell you a story and I want you to imagine a story which for me answers why Shakespeare is great. Okay, and I'll, I'll just have some slides uh, for you to look at while I walk you through this story and um, you can tell me what you think. Um, you know, the, the question is what, can Shakespeare possibly have to say to today's youth or today's young adults or even today's old adults? How can Shakespeare possibly be relevant to them? Let's take a moment and just imagine, imagine that you've entered a little late at the classroom of a crotchety old dinosaur professor at a major university. You find a seat in the back and look around. The professor is lecturing from behind a podium using lecture notes and does not look up when you enter. Only half the seats are taken. He wears a, way, a worn gray tweed jacket, faded blue shirt, and a darker blue thin tie. His mottled gray white hair is splayed out in a classic Einstein. The students look like first year university students, bored, fidgety, a couple actually sleeping. One handsome young woman with, a short, with short black hair, milk chocolate skin, wearing a black dress and black lipstick has her hand raised, arm waving slightly, supporting it with her other hand. She looks like she's been waiting a while. And the professor speaks, <clears throat> presents the reader with many challenges, not the least of which is Elizabethan diction and Shakespeare's poetic compression, but every reader will take the time, who takes the time will discover a bounty of humanistic treasures. The professor stops and looks at her over his silver reading glasses. Yes. One word conveys his lack of good cheer. Questions are not encouraged. I'm sorry, professor, but I just don't get it, she says, exuding the sweet arrogance and mimicries of intellectual youth. Shakespeare represents the view of the classic white male Eurocentric patriarchy, one that's hundreds of years old in a dated vocabulary that's hard to understand. What's his relevance today? I mean, what could Shakespeare possibly have to say to me? As she speaks, the professor's eyes glaze and his head lowers slightly until he's staring down at the podium. 
He gives every appearance of being an old man in constant mental and physical pain. Several students murmur at least partial agreement. The professor stands for almost a full minute before turning to the blackboard. He picks up the chalk and with a trembling hand, writes two words on the board, chair and stool. He turns and stares at her. He speaks softly. Would you say, Miss, Ms. Powers, would you say, Ms. Powers, that the word chair and stool distinguish two similar things? Uh, yeah, I think, yes, of course. And do you think, Ms. Powers, that these represent a distinction worth preserving? For example, if I were to ask you to bring me a chair and you brought me a stool, would we have reason to believe there existed between us some failure of communication? Yes, she said confidently. What would be the nature of the failure? Uh, a chair normally has a back for support while a stool does not. Good. So you concede, Ms. Powers, that vocabulary helps us more clearly distinguish the specific differences between like things, yes? Yes. Is it a good thing to distinguish more clearly the specific differences between like things? I suppose and that it would be better to possess a mind with a larger vocabulary than a mind with a smaller one. Although he still speaks softly, the air begins to thicken. But just because someone has a better vocabulary doesn't mean that they are a better person. She speaks less confidently now. Ms. Powers, he says a little bit louder, if we are going to understand each other, it is best that you respond to what I actually say rather than what you think I am saying. I did not say anything about a better vocabulary or anything to do with being a better person. I asked if you thought it better to possess a mind with a larger vocabulary rather than a mind with a smaller vocabulary, especially since you have already conceded that it is a good thing to be more clearly, to more clearly distinguish the specific differences between like things. Or do you see another way of distinguishing specific differences in ways other than a versatile and specific vocabulary? No. Ms. Powers, suppose you and I walk into a garden and while I was a novice at gardening, you were an expert gardener who had a command of the technical language and knowledge of botany and gardening. Would our experience of that particular garden be any different? Uh, Yes, a little. We would both see the same thing, but I would probably be more knowledgeable about it if, if you ask me questions. No, Ms. Powers, I'm afraid you are entirely mistaken. We would not be seeing the same garden at all. I would merely see pretty flowers, maybe some trees and grass. I may be able to tell the difference between a rose and a tulip, but that is all. I would see the mere surface of the garden, its mere appearance, but you, Ms. Powers, you would see an entirely different garden. You would be able to penetrate its depths. You would be able to recognize not only the different flowers, the carnations and snapdragons and pansies and hyacinths and lilies, you would also recognize the relative health of each of these flowers. You would recognize any pests or diseased plants. You would be able to spot where each plant or flower was in its life cycle. By their arrangement and care, you would know their past. In some cases, whether or not they were recently planted. You would know how much the person who tends the garden knows about his or her occupation. You would be also know the difference between annuals and perennials. And this knowledge would allow you to see not only the present garden, but the future of that garden. You could predict its course and suggest actions to alter that course. No, Ms. Powers, you and I would not see the same garden at all because a true and rich vocabulary opens one to higher levels of perceptual and conceptual awareness. A specific vocabulary rewards you with a greater awareness and the possibility of a deep causal awareness, the ability to distinguish true causes and their array of effects. And were you so inclined, you could, would naturally begin seeing the world in terms of gardens. You would begin constructing metaphors and similes, perhaps even analogies connecting life to that garden through an array of subtle similarities. Do you know the number of distinct words in the average person's vocabulary, Ms. Powers? About 3,000 words, assuming that all forms of word, like run, ran, running, counted as one, 3,000 words, enough to get an average person through the day and through their lifetime. Do you know how many distinct words are in the King James Version of the Bible? Around 4,300, not counting names. That means that all the history and philosophy and meaning of all the variety of ideas expressed in the Bible can be transmitted in a vocabulary of 4,300 words, enough to challenge the average reader. 
Soon we will get to, the John, to John Milton's Paradise Lost. John Milton commanded an incredible vocabulary. He mastered several languages, including Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Italian, and French. And he wrote not only epic poetry, but many rigorous political tracts. Some of his sentences are so powerful and complex in their vocabulary, grammar, and meaning that they contain several dozen clauses. John Milton was a genius who mastered and crafted meaning out of the vocabulary of almost 8,000 words, more than almost all living writers. He, but Shakespeare, <laughs> Shakespeare exists in his own genus. When a rhetorician reads Shakespeare, she points out that Shakespeare was a master rhetorician who knew not only all the technical terms, ancient and modern, but was a master practitioner who applied that knowledge throughout his poems and plays in a way that have stood as examples for generations to follow. When a gardener reads Shakespeare, she says that Shakespeare must have been a gardener because he not only displays the technical terminology of botany and gardening and herbology, he demonstrates the kind of knowledge that comes from working in or studying closely a sophisticated English, English garden. When a lawyer reads Shakespeare, she tells us that Shakespeare must have had a legal education because he not only displays an astonishing range of accuracy with his use of legal terms, but he also commands an understanding of the history and philosophy of law. And you can point to other professions, actor, soldier, physician, courtier, historian, politician, but that's not all. In his plays, he explores the range and depth of human emotions and experience. He explores love, but not just the young romantic love of Romeo and Juliet. He explores love between siblings and parent and child and comrades in arms, young love, middle-aged love, old love, love between the low and the low, the low and the high, the high and the high, false love, true love, jaded love, betrayed love, self-love, love of good and love of indulgence. Like turning a diamond in the light, he explores every facet of love and hate and envy and greed and lust and jealousy and innocence and sweetness and revenge and a hundred subtle emotional and intellectual states of which you have yet to take conscious stock. His capacious, capacious mind wandered everywhere, and in almost every way he has arrived there before you have, articulating it with a mastery that leaves later writers sick with wondering in what territory of the human heart human intellect and human action is left to explore. He seems to have experienced the full range and depth of common human experience and encapsulated that experience more beautifully than any other. His head jerks to her. Shakespeare, Ms. Powers, displays a vocabulary of over 22,000 words, almost three times Milton's vocabulary, and you wonder why you find reading him challenging and you dare to wonder if Shakespeare has anything to teach you? May I suggest to you, Ms. Powers, that you have a choice. You can continue to dwell on the surface of life, holding up external experiences as if they were everything. Appearances just par parroting the rhymes and rhythms of a fast food consciousness, flaccid and without true self-animation, smug in the knowledge that you have comfortably given yourself over to a group numbness, submitting to mere external authority. Or maybe, just maybe, with personal effort, a healthy skepticism, and a sense of individual exploration, you may become your own authority by expanding your mind in a constant effort to comprehend Shakespeare's. May I suggest that until you are well along into that journey, your mind and emotions will remain susceptible to every sophistic thought that knocks on your door seeking to enslave you with its mere appearance of originality. It's time, Ms. Powers, that you begin feeding on Shakespeare rather than on that damned fast food. He pauses. That's all for today. Here's the thing. A life of reading Shakespeare is a life of constant, surprising growth. It's a life that will offer thoughtless youth an increasing opportunity to actually become thoughtful adults. And it's really amazing. It truly is. You see, Shakespeare has so much to offer. It, it, and it's not something that's readily understood until you have a good teacher and you start diving in. And 
you know, there's there's great things on the internet you can look at. Um, there's a, there's there's a series of videos called Playing Shakespeare. They're all they're like of a master class, and you'll see some actors like in in um, <laughs> what's his name, the guy who played Gandalf, as a young man in this class, answering questions and talking about Shakespeare Shakespeare's brilliance. Um, and other other British and American actors. Picard from Star Trek, The Next, Next Generation is in there. Um, that's one. There's a book if you're inclined to read. Um, the best play-by-play -play guide there is, is a, by a gentleman, Harold C. Goddard, G-O-D-D-A-R-D. -D and I'll, uh, I'll have a link in the descriptions to these things. Um, Harold C. Goddard, he wrote a book called The Meaning of Shakespeare. It's... Um, been in print for 70, over 70 years, uh, because there's nobody that does what he does. He, bring, he brings life and light to Shakespeare in incredible and wonderful ways. I strongly encourage you to go there. I will um, do more on Shakespeare, especially if you put it in the comments, I'll come back to Shakespeare. Um, next time, I think I'll try going to Mozart. We'll see how that works. And if YouTube allows me to do some of the music that I wanna do. Um, in the meantime, thanks for joining me. Bye-bye, take care, and uh, have a good old time. <laughs>